Now, after the last few years, we all have a bit of a, bit of a better understanding of what quarantine actually is, right? But long ago, way before COVID, even around the time Melbourne was being formed as a city, this site was here. The station's long and tragic history, which involves, of course, the treatment of sick and dying patients, has only added to its reputation as a paranormal hotbed. Dad, as our tech guy, yeah. you're gonna be our tech guy for the tour? Yeah. As our tech guy, what have we got? For so I've got my tour? ancient, ancient, ancient <laughs> camera here, <laughs> but it does actually film in infrared. And our new camera is actually, it's quite an expensive feature. Okay, so if you were wondering, a infrared night vision camera is a recording device that's used for video and audio, and it uses night vision technology to see in low light conditions, so in the dark. Night vision operates by amplifying any light within the camera's range, and it basically means that even a small match can illuminate an entire room when viewed through the camera's screen. Now, these cameras are often used in paranormal investigations to capture light anomalies or orbs on film. They can be set up in stationary positions or carried by an investigator. Most importantly, night vision cameras allow ghost hunters to see and record anything in low light conditions, making them essential to capturing visual evidence of the supernatural. And then this is a voice oh, recorder yeah. for doing, um, so to do, doing playback, so if you can hear anything in the background. A voice recorder is simply used to capture EVPs, electronic voice phenomena, which are voices captured on recording equipment that weren't heard at the time of the recording. Capturing a voice that wasn't supposed to be there is a pretty convincing way of collecting evidence that something strange is going on. And the information that you can get from even one word is huge. You can not only gauge if the entity is intelligently interactive, but from the tone alone, you can potentially discern the entity's gender, nationality, age, time period, mental state, and more. Proper usage involves asking clear questions during investigations and reviewing recordings with a critical ear for responses hidden in the static. What's, what's that red glowy thing? Oh, so that's a speaker for this. So this is a spirit yeah. box, I call it. it. Is. Yeah. Put it simply, the spirit box is a radio, but primarily it's used in paranormal research as a spirit communication tool. It's used to connect with spirits or ghosts by detecting EVPs, electronic voice phenomena, due to a slight modification that enables it to rapidly scan multiple radio stations at once, non-stop, as opposed to standard radios that play a single station at once. It scans both AM and FM without stopping at a specific frequency. Essentially, it picks up on paranormal activity while scanning the stations, and it can detect noises, audio, and voices mainly in the form of whole phrases or sentences. So this is a speaker for it. Nice. Well, yeah. this is a test to show what this looks like when it's not potentially bugging out. I don't think we've got anything yeah. off it ever. So. As we entered the park, all together, we were greeted by our tour guide and taken to the information centre where we started our tour. Here in Australia, the first Quarantine Act was legislated in 1832 and required that space and provision be set aside for quarantine. A site near St Kilda called Little Red Bluff was originally chosen, but that proved to be completely inadequate when a ship called the Glen Huntley arrived. Absolutely riddled with pox. The death rate on that ship was so high, they had no choice but to bury their dead in the bay, thrown unweighted overboard. It wasn't long before they started washing up in Melbourne. A fisherman even caught one in his net one morning. It was this big. After the Glen Huntley, the site for Quarantine Station was chosen to be here for a few reasons. The water out on the bay is quite deep, the site was isolated, remote and practically uninhabited. Apart from a shepherd up on the hill in his little cottage, a few fishermen and some lime kiln workers. There was ample land for farming and there was an abundance of timber and water. But as far as actual facilities were concerned, well, there were none, just open paddocks. At the time, every ship that sailed into Port Phillip Bay was required to stop and wait for a doctor to go aboard and complete a medical inspection. If disease or infection was found on that ship, it was forced to fly a flag, a yellow flag, from its mast and it would quarantine for 40 days. But after almost an entire year, the Australian government had done nothing apart from build a few store sheds. Now, that all proved hopelessly and dangerously inadequate, when at the end of that year, in 1850, 
ship called the Ticonderoga sailed into Port Phillip Bay. Imagine the scenes as Ticonderoga arrived from England. Overcrowded with about 850 passengers living in cramped, unsanitary conditions. 850 passengers is nearly double the recommended amount of passengers for a boat of this size. Typhus came aboard the ship carried by lice and spread rapidly in the filthy conditions, leading to severe illness and death even among the ship's doctor. Upon arrival, over 100 passengers had died and hundreds more were desperately ill. The death toll on that ship rose rapidly. It started at just a few a week, then it was a few a day, and then several a day, as many as nine or 10 home families were passing. In other cases, parents died, leaving behind small children to fend for themselves. The dead were wrapped in cloth and buried out in the bay, but cloth was hard to come by and it was in short supply. So the dead were wrapped in pairs before descending into Davy Jones' locker. By the time Ticonderoga arrived in Port Phillip Bay, more than 100 people were already dead and hundreds more were desperately ill. And everyone in one way or another had felt the impacts of the typhus outbreak. Lower decks of that ship had become nothing more than a floating festpool. Now, when their quarantine period finished and passengers were allowed on land, there were no facilities here for them. Up on the eastern boundary, police barracks were built for eight police and two horses. They were here to prevent escapees and to suppress unruly, unhappy quarantine passengers. Of the 850 or so that left England, fewer than 600 finally entered Melbourne, and we know from historical record that many of them were in terrible condition. This early catastrophe only highlighted to the authorities the desperate need for a proper functioning quarantine facility here at the colony. But it took the government forever to do anything about it. Many of the buildings you're going to see this evening, five years went on by after Ticonderoga before construction even began on those. In 1952, the military repurposed the station as a training school for their cadets. But by then, more than 300 ships and literally tens of thousands of passengers had quarantined here. A lot of the ghosts that we're going to talk about tonight were actually first um, witnessed or uh, reported by the military in the post-quarantine years, um, which was a bit of a surprise to them. And it unnerved them a bit as well, obviously. It freaked them out. They believed that they were here uh, training to fight enemy armies, uh, not the supernatural. Why this building and why is the figure here always seen sobbing, always seen howling in anguish? Well, all of our stories tonight have historical stories that fit. At the turn of the century, uh, a young lady was brought to Hospital 2, heavily, heavily infected with smallpox, heavily pregnant also. Within a few hours of arriving here at Hospital 2, she gave birth. Her daughter was immediately taken from her by the wet nurses here at the camp, never to be held in her mother's arms. Very shortly after, the mother passed. So imagine the physical torment and pain she was in from having smallpox. And imagine the mental anguish she was going through over the perceived loss of her daughter. When people talk about a sobbing, howling, mouth wide open figure in hospital too, we think it might just be her. This is the foul luggage room. This is where everybody who arrived at quarantine's clothing would go. It would get sorted into what could be salvageable and what needed to be thrown out. I got to lay on the slab of the morgue. Uh, <laughs> feed that in for me, thank you. Go, oh, Alex. Grab his feet at the drain, then. Yeah. Feet at the drain. Very important question, Alex, to determine how well this thing goes. Thousands of I felt like a little weird when on the slab, but I also have anxiety and just felt like my normal like anxious symptoms of like my heart was racing. Like I felt a little weak and yucky after, but I think that's just, I was excited and nervous um, because I was lying where people had been autopsied on. So crazy, um, but that was pretty cool. This is the luggage cleaning room. This is basically where if your clothes were deemed salvageable, they would go into these disinfection and boiler buildings, which are basically designed to clean and boil all of your clothes so that they were clean and could be used and worn throughout the quarantine site. So this is what they look like from the inside. That's where all of that really, really hot water would go. And then this is the boiling system for all of that water that would disinfect all of these clothes. 
From this point on in, in the tour, I started to take lots of photos and videos with my phone. And I noticed that when I had a video going with flash, I would get lots of light anomalies coming across the screen. I'll try and highlight them for you now if you haven't already seen a couple in this video. I am unsure of whether it is dust or whether it is a anomaly or something supernatural. I can't debunk it fully, but I also am not 100% sure that what I am seeing on these videos is supernatural activity. Let's play that video again, shall we? Right as I start the video, there's a light anomaly that shoots on the top right hand side to the left hand side. Did you catch it? I'll play that one again. This is the video in slow-mo and it only pops up on one tiny portion of the slow-mo video. As I pan the camera, there's another light anomaly that shoots from the middle of the screen up to the top. This is in slow-mo. As I walk through the luggage room, you're gonna notice plenty more. A lot of them are quite faint um, and have quite a straight direction to them. But there are a couple that I do think are quite strange that are quite bright and do tend to curve and move around as I'm moving around as well. Now, I didn't see these with my own eyes as I was walking around. I've only seen them as I am looking back at this footage. A lot of the orbs that I'm pointing out are the main ones. You may have spotted others that I haven't pointed out. Some of them are very faint and very, very quick. These are the ones that have caught my eye the most. This one is one of my favorites because the orb is so bright and you can literally see it curve as it comes around that corner, um, almost to miss me and go around me. This orb is another really convincing one just because it shoots up from the floor, almost is coming directly towards me and then at the last second veers off right in front of me. You can really see that curve to it, which is just amazing. So the reason why I think these are orbs and not dust especially the ones with that curve to them because dust would just sort of float by. These are very, very quick. It's not a lens flare. They don't move with the camera when I move. They have their own movement to them. They have their own light to them um, and they move very, very quickly. So I think that we've got some real orbs on camera here, which is really exciting. So what do you is call that, this? That's a relatively new battery. Um, this is where they bathed and disinfected people. Um, yeah. So they were bathed in carbolic acid and... Um, Lysol soap, like really, really strong disinfectant. Now there is a lens flare on my camera, but it's that blue dot. This orb is pretty strange because we are outside and I wouldn't expect a piece of dust to be in this environment. It is quite bright, but it does really fly straight across. So a little bit of mixed feelings about this one. This next set of images both scares and excites me. In these photos, I very clearly see a shadowed veiled figure standing in the doorway. Here are the images in full. There's six total which capture this shadow figure. As you can see in this video, these images were taken about one second apart. When I first saw these images, I thought that the shadow figure was my own reflection. However, upon review, if it was my own reflection, it should be directly in front of the camera. I also realized that no shadow could have been created due to the setup of the photo. This is the video footage I have right before I took these photos. And as you can see, you couldn't film or take photos with your flash on because of the dust and dirt on the window panes. Upon realizing this, I called Ashley over to hold his torch to the window so there was enough light for me to take a photo. As Ashley's torch was to the window along with my phone, it's impossible for the shadow figure to be my own shadow as the light source was not directly behind me, it was in front of me. As I put these six photos into this video, I also realized that the shadow figure moves. In the first image, its head is lowered, and in the last image, its head is facing the camera slash light source. Here are the images in quick succession. You can really see the movement of the figure. These videos did highlight some light anomalies around the figure itself. It's like it distorts light as it moves, but this could also be to slight camera movements, which may have distorted the dirt and the dust on the windows, seeing that my camera was up against the window. I do not think that the shadow figure is a distortion of the dust due to it being darker and not lighter than its surroundings. And at no point does the shadow cross over the first doorway, indicating that it's standing in between the two doorways. 
I also realize that the camera does move slightly as I am taking the images. However, the main movement of the shadow figure occurs in the upper part of the head. The head seems to move to face the camera or distort. It's not the same shape that moves left or right. As you have seen, we started to play around with some filters to try and see if we could highlight the figure more. The Eerie 2's quarantine station ghost to a Facebook page posted an edited version of the figure that made it stand out more, and we wanted to do the same. Here are our photos. We used Photoshop to play around with some filters, and as you can see in every photo, this figure is highlighted. This is the first piece of evidence that I have ever collected on any ghost or paranormal investigation that I cannot debunk. I do think that in these six images, I have captured a shadow figure. I really hope we see a ghost. I'm going to prove all them haters wrong with the evidence that I collect. I'm going to get everybody filming and we're going to capture something. I just know it. This is another video I took before taking three more images in a different room. As you can see, without Ashley's flash, it is quite dark in these disinfectant rooms. And as you can see, all of the rooms have the exact same setup. And in these pictures, we didn't capture any shadow figures. We did get the chance the next day to go back and have a wander around. I did get some footage of the room in which I captured the shadow figure seen here, and there is nothing which explains the shadow figure. I also got some footage of the room in which we captured nothing on camera seen here. While recording in Hospital 3, I did capture lots of light anomalies and one potential orb. The orb seems to shoot up from the floor and shoot right past me on the right hand side, sort of curving to avoid me. I have highlighted some other light anomalies I caught in these videos, but due to the movements of them as they move straight across and do not move with purpose or curve around me, I think that what I have captured in Hospital 3 is lots of specks of reflective dust and one potential orb. We did use the spirit box in Hospital 3 as well, but recorded no voices and got no intelligent responses. During the ghost tour, we only got the opportunity to walk past Hospital 4 as it's closed to the public. We did take some photos of the outside as there is a story surrounding a nun that has been captured on camera around Hospital 4. We couldn't enter Hospital 5 as it is closed to the public, but it definitely felt like we were being watched from the windows. So we did take plenty of photos from the outside to try and catch something. Unfortunately, none of our photos captured anything. During the ghost tour, we noticed our guide was using an app called Ghost Tube to receive words from ghosts. And he got words such as listening when I was listening back to audio recordings I did, which I'm putting down to coincidence. I am very skeptical of this app just because I'm unsure how it works and how reliable the information it gives is. Apparently, the app uses phone environmental sensors to measure the fluctuations in the environment. By calibrating Magnetic North, the app can apparently use this sensor to measure magnetic interference and select words from the dictionary when corresponding magnetic signatures are detected. The app says that Ghost Tube only selects words based on the environmental readings from the sensors in your device only. They don't use any personal information or microphone input to generate or select words. During the tour, Sarah was using the Ghost SLS and captured one weird anomaly using the feature. Using the latest LiDAR technology, light detection and ranging, Ghost Tube SLS projects a grid of infrared light just like the traditional kinetic SLS camera and uses the infrared grid to detect depths and objects in the room. Ghost Tube says that their SLS is a superior alternative if used on a LiDAR equipped device. Now a LiDAR equipped device was not used when using the SLS setting as an iPhone 14 rear camera was used. So I'm unsure of how accurate this figure capture is. Sasha and uh, his other Anzac colleagues are over the moon to be returning to Melbourne. They've survived the war, they're heading home to rejoin their family and friends. The reality, Sasha, unfortunately, is returning long and miserable stay here in quarantine and Sasha it's made even worse for you because very sadly you've contracted Spanish flu. We had a very short time at the influenza huts but I did take some photos. When looking through the photos I saw what looked like a face in the window of image one. However in image two it seemed slightly more blurred. We did manage to go back the next day to see if we could debunk the image 
and we did. Okay, so last night I got a weird photo and I wanna come and debunk it because it looks like there's a face in the photo. Oh no, there's something in the window. I debunked. Debunked. You got that? Debunked. <laughs> yeah, I reckon it's this. This is apparently, I think, the kitchen or something. There's a guy bouncing around the window on, on, on the ghost app. Do we believe the ghosty app? I don't know. It's the first thing I've seen is a guy bouncing around in the window. They're not bouncing around in those windows. Because my ghost app, Ghost Tube, is just currently now. giving me words, but they don't, I'm answering questions like and they don't make sense. Window. Have you put your phone in it? No, I did it when I was shining it at it. Right? Nothing in that but you've got reflections going, go put it like to the window. I'm really scared of there's something like <laughs> Hello, come and say hi. Come and wave out the window. No, and it's exactly the same position, same place, he's not doing it. That's music. <laughs> So as you can see, this is what I meant about the ghost tube app when I said I don't trust it because on the spirit box app, it doesn't scan the radio frequencies quickly enough that it's just static or very quick snippets of songs. That was like a full snippet of a song. So I'm unsure if any of the voices we captured were people talking on the radio or a spirit just because I don't think the spirit box app on ghost tube scans those frequencies quickly enough here to i don't know see if there's any ghosts around do you live here where are we this app is highly suspicious where are we right now it's the app is giving me words but they're not smart answers I will say that this voice is pretty strange and it is pretty good evidence despite it being captured on ghost tube we only ever captured it around hospital four and it was the exact same voice and it is just long enough to sort of span over multiple radio frequencies <laughs> Come here with other people. There's some practice. Currently, we're using an app called Ghost Tube, which I'm unsure about. I did get drowned earlier, which was weirdly specific because people did used to drown here. That's probably the only smart answer I've gotten so far. But my phone is actively dying in front of my very eyes, so. Yeah, it's on 9%, but my battery is also really bad. Do you want to use mine? Yeah, there you go. Drowned. So that's the only smart word that I've got so far from this app. Mum's seen some figures on it. What? Yeah. Well, I Did saw... You... When you sat down, yeah. Not feeling there was well. something sitting... Ooh, that's another very on point one. There was something sitting on that chair, and then at, when you, you were sitting over here, and yeah. then as you moved in this direction, yeah. it moved closer to you, and then when you got that response, yeah. it was sitting at the table with you. Which you freaked me out quite recording. substantially. Yeah, I just got yeah. not feeling Unless well and drowned. IPhone, yeah, I, I just got not feeling well and drowned, which is the first smart-ish response that I've gotten so far. Yeah, they felt generating like responses not feeling not well you grounded. are annoying you are annoying thanks queen <laughs> like those ones i'm like that's probably generated but drowned and not feeling well they're on topic you know grandfather nope i've only got one anomalies in that window and then i've got the anomalies over there. pathetic 
Again? Why is there such hatred here? It's cold. It is cold. Yeah, it's certainly, you're right, oh, actually, it's, it responds to reflections very yeah. well. Clinch. Open it. Am I dead? <sighs> oh. Yeah, but... Uh, Brittany. Who's Brittany? Brittany's not even an alien in the round there. That's what I mean. I also said Kayla earlier. I was like, I don't think so. Jane, maybe. Is there anybody around? Where are we right now? What did this building used to be? Is there anybody around? Any other voices? Yeah, I think I heard someone say my name is English. Oh. Harry. Harry. That could be a name. Is your name Harry? Yes or no answers only. What did this building used to be? Is there anybody that still lives here? It was like spooky vibes, but not the craziest tour I've ever had. And I said, I feel like the immense amount of people made it annoying, if that makes sense. You know, Craig, shout out to Craig, our guide. He was awesome, very knowledgeable, very funny. So that was really cool. He was really good. I really wish I had, like, I tried to audio record stuff. We didn't end up getting anything on audio recordings. Unfortunately, our little mic recorder died, and so did Dad's nighttime camera also died, which is highly suspicious that what's going on there. But yeah, it was cool. The history was amazing and so interesting and I love that morbid history kind of stuff. But I think the tour itself wasn't great. I think it needs a little bit of rethinking and rejigging, but the guides are amazing um, and it's still really cool history wise. And they've got some amazing photos in the past as well. Like he was showing us some wacky photos of like, I don't know what the f that is. Like I can't explain that. That's insane. That's my little confession cam. I have to go pee. Talk later. <laughs>